This is the demonstration video for the cinnamon pinwheels. Cooking principles. One, the biscuit method of mixing, cutting in solid fat, kneading the dough. The biscuit method. Step one, sift dry ingredients together. Step two, cut in solid fat with a pastry blender. Step three, add enough liquid ingredients to the dry ingredients to form a soft but not sticky dough. Step four, Knead the dough and develop gluten, and create layers. Two, a type of quick bread, quick to make due to using baking powder to leaven. Leavening agents are ingredients that cause our products to rise. Baking powder is the leavening agent most frequently used in flour mixtures. It is a commercially prepared leavening agent made from an acid and a salt form, soda, which is usually sodium bicarbonate, and starch, which is usually cornstarch. When mixed with a liquid, they create carbon dioxide gas that will help raise our flour mixture. Baking soda will act as a leavening agent when it's combined with another acidic substance, such as buttermilk or sour cream, vinegar, or even cream of tartar. When it's combined with one of these ingredients, it too will also produce carbon dioxide gas that will help raise our flour mixture. 3. The consistency of an unbaked crust of a soft dough. One part liquid ingredients, three part dry ingredients. Nutrition Simple carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are responsible for supplying the body with energy, sparring protein, and assisting the utilization of fats. Fat. Fat helps protect your body and insulate body parts such as major organs, supplies energy to your whole body, transports fat-soluble vitamins such as A, D, E, and K, and supplies your body with essential fatty acids needed for functioning. Vitamin B. B vitamins help the body turn carbohydrates into energy, help with normal growth and development of the body, maintain good appetite and normal digestion, and is essential for the proper functioning of your nervous system. Ingredients. Biscuit crust. 250 milliliters all-purpose flour. Gluten is the protein found within flour that when combined with a liquid will form strong elastic strands. Heat from the oven will harden this protein creating the structure of our biscuits. 25 milliliters of sugar. Sugar will not only sweeten our biscuit dough today but provide the golden brown color as it caramelizes in the oven. Biscuits tend to be quite pale so the caramelization color will only show up on the bottom and the edges only. 10 milliliters baking powder. Baking powder is a leavening agent that when combined with a liquid will help produce carbon dioxide gas which is needed to help leaven our biscuits. 1 milliliter of salt. Salt enhances natural flavors found within any recipe. Today's filling features both brown sugar and cinnamon and the salt will help make it shine through. 40 milliliters cold margarine. This solid fat acts as a tenderizer for it interferes with the development of gluten, keeping our biscuits soft in texture. It will also help melt, creating pockets for the steam to flow through, creating the flaky layers that is typical in anything using the biscuit method. 85 milliliters of milk. Milk serves two purposes. One, it's the liquid needed to activate the baking powder, and two, it is the liquid needed to activate gluten within the flour, creating our structure. The milk helps bring our dough together and then makes it so that we can knead it and form our soft biscuit layers. Filling 30 milliliters of soft margin. This fat will help act as glue, binding the filling ingredients together and holding it to the biscuit crust. As the margarine will melt in the oven, the filling ingredients will combine, making a gooey caramel center. 40 milliliters of brown sugar. 
Brown sugar will create the caramel filling in the middle of your cinnamon pinwheel as it melts the margarine in the oven. It also will add moisture to your biscuit dough as the ingredient molasses found within brown sugar tends to be hydroscopic, holding onto as much moisture as it can. Five milliliters of cinnamon Cinnamon is a dried spice that comes from the inner bark of a tree. It doesn't usually have a sweet taste, but tends to amplify the sweetness in other ingredients and adds a depth of flavor to any recipe it's added to. 80 milliliters of raisins, optional. Raisins are dried grapes, but the process of drying them both intensifies their nutrients and sugars. The raisins today will add a chewy texture to our cinnamon pinwheel. They are high in iron and fiber. 30 milliliters walnuts, optional. Walnuts will add a crunchy texture to our cinnamon pinwheel filling. They are also rich in heart healthy fats, omega 3s, and high in antioxidants. These are all the ingredients you need to make the cinnamon pinwheels. Equipment. For this recipe, you will need measuring equipment, including dry measures, liquid measure, and small measures, metal spatula, custard cups, muffin tin, paper baking liners, Sieve, metal pie plate, metal spoon, large mixing bowl, pastry blender, fork, pastry mat, rolling pin, Rubber spatula. Dinner knife. Chef's knife. Cutting board. Oven mitts. Hot mat. A cooling rack. And finally, saucepan. Method. Bachette stands for the beginning steps that you need to do at the start of your lab. B stands for books and bags. They should be away either at the back of the classroom or under your table. A stands for apron, which you need to put on to help protect your clothing. S stands for sleeves. You need to roll them up past your elbows. H stands for long hair that touches the shoulders that needs to be tied back or hats that need to be removed. C stands for chairs that should be tucked under your table and out of your way. H stands for hands that should be washed properly for 30 seconds using hot water and soap. E stands for equipment which you should be getting out as quickly as possible without wasting time. And T stands for the towels that you need to pick up you need at least two dishcloths and two tea towels. Step one, use oven racks number four and number five. Preheat oven to 425 degrees Fahrenheit, 220 degrees Celsius. Hot oven needed to help create layers in biscuits. When setting the temperature of our oven, press the bake button, then use the arrows to go up to 425 degrees. The oven temperature for baking biscuits is usually quite hot. This ensures the biscuits will rise quickly, forming layers, which are the characteristic of a good product. Step two, if desired, rehydrate raisins by pouring boiling water over them to cover. Let sit for 10 to 15 minutes before draining and using. There are two ways you can rehydrate your raisins. One, boil some water in a kettle, put your raisins into a saucepan and pour the hot boiling water on top and cover and set aside for 10 to 15 minutes. Or you can bring the water to a boil in the saucepan on the stove top, add your raisins and let sit for 10 to 15 minutes. Let's take a look at what the raisins should look like at the very end once they've been boiled long enough. Here you see on my spoon, I have two raisins. One, the one that's been rehydrated and two, the one that hasn't. The rehydrated raisin should be at least double the size. What we want to do is put more water content into the raisin so that when it's cooking in the oven, it doesn't uh, become too dry or hard 
or chewy. Step three, line six cup muffin tin with six baking liners. Groups of three, nine baking liners and a 12 cup muffin tin fill any empty cups with cold water. Now due to the fact that the cinnamon buns will have a sugary caramel filling, they're easy to burn if you're baking them on a cookie sheet. So if we line a muffin tin with paper liners, we're guaranteed to have an easier cleanup. Plus the muffin tin helps keep the cinnamon roll in its perfect cylindrical shape. So that way you'll get even equal sizes of circles rather than on a cookie sheet where it might um, rise and twist to the side and then it won't look symmetrical. Step four, sift flour, measure, and sift again into a large bowl. Stir in the sugar, baking powder, and salt. First step of the biscuit method. Sifting adds air and gets rid of lumps. Now we sift flour for two different reasons. One, to remove any lumps that might be found within our flour bucket. No one wants to bite into a cinnamon pinwheel and get a mouthful of raw flour. But two, we're adding in air. Creating air pockets within our flour mixture is really important to help for a successful rise of our biscuit dough. Biscuit dough needs to double in height really fast. Air pockets help the carbon dioxide travel through the dough rapidly, causing this rapid rise. So when I'm remeasuring my flour here, I'm being very gentle not to deflate any of the air. And when I level off my dry measure, you will notice that the air has replaced some of the total volume of flour. That's what's how much air I put into the flour. Then to help it even further, I'm going to re-sift this flour one more time, trying to add in as much air pockets as I can. And that way I'm going to have hopefully a very successful product. Then following our first step of our biscuit method, I'm going to add in all the other dry ingredients to this bowl. So we have sugar, um, which will help sweeten our baking powder, which is our leavening agent, which will help create that carbon dioxide and salt, which will help enhance our flavors. Once all our dry ingredients are in the bowl together, I'm going to use a wooden spoon and just very gently combine all the dry ingredients together. Be careful not to stir this too crazily because again, you can deflate the air pockets we just created. Step five, measure cold margarine using the water displacement method. When measuring with the water displacement method, fill your liquid measure with cold water so it doesn't accidentally melt your margarine. Then using two spoons, push your margarine down to the bottom of the cup, helping it stick to the bottom. This way we see the water line slowly raising up. If you have it floating on top, the measurement will be inaccurate. If you accidentally put too much margarine into the cup, you can always take a little bit out. The fat won't mix with the water. Once you have gotten the proper measurement, drain the water and you're ready to add it to your bowl. Step six, with a pastry blender or two dinner knives, cut fat margarine into dry ingredients until the fat is the size of frozen green peas. This is the second step of the biscuit method. Knead to form layers. During baking, the solid fat will melt between the flour layers, leaving spaces between the layers. When we go to cut in the fat, it is important we use a pastry blender. The wires will help break up the fat into small pieces while not damaging the air quality that we introduced into our flour. Have a metal spatula handy to help push the margarine through the wires as at the beginning it will get quite sticky until the flour has coated the little balls of margarine. It will continue to stick into the wires of the pastry blender. So use that metal spatula just to gently clean the pastry blender as you go and then keep cutting the fat. We want to make sure the fat is very, very small. Small air pockets will help the carbon dioxide push through better. A large pat of butter melting in the oven only creates a giant butter pool and not an air pocket. So it's very important that it's very small. If you don't have a pastry blender at home, there are several options you can use. Two dinner knives in a crisscross like motion, or be creative. You could use a fork, you could use a potato masher, you could even get your hands in the bowl and crumble up the butter with your fingertips. Or do the French method, which is to freeze the butter and grate it on a grater. There are many different ways you could do this step. Always use the tools you have at home. Step seven, gradually, a little at a time, add milk to the flour mixture while tossing with a fork. Add enough milk to make a soft but not sticky dough. 
Some of the milk might not be used. Mix quickly and lightly until the mixture comes away from the sides of the bowl. This is the third step of the biscuit method. Do not overmix, otherwise gluten will become tough and heavy and the product will have poor volume and texture. Less chance of overmixing if using a fork. This is one of the most important stages of making biscuit dough. Adding too much liquid will overactivate the gluten, causing our product to be so tough and chewy and pretty much inedible. So, making sure you're only adding milk to dry spots of the dough is crucial. I like to use my fork and move the dough around to look on the underside. That's where I tend to find dry flour hiding. Make sure you only use enough milk to make sure all the ingredients are combined together. And in this case, I know I had about 30 mils of milk left over. This is because depending on how much air you add it at the beginning steps, um, you won't need all the milk because you don't have enough flour to soak it all up. So that's why you might have milk left behind. Sifting flour really does make a difference. If you did accidentally add too much liquid to your dough, you will have to correct it by slowly adding five mils of flour at a time to your dough until it is soft and pliable again and not sticky that it coats your hands. Step eight, lightly flour the clean countertop or table. Knead dough eight to 10 times. Avoid a coating of flour on the surface of the dough. To knead, fold dough in half Press down and make a quarter turn. Repeat seven to nine times. This is the fourth step of the biscuit method. Kneading will mix the ingredients, develop gluten, and add air. Now I like to use a pastry mat to do this step because it gives me a chance to see um, a grid when I go to roll my dough. I still will flour the pastry mat so the dough doesn't stick to the surface of the mat. Now make sure you have a light coating of flour, not too much. And I'm using the leftover sifted flour because I know it's lump free. Turn out your dough onto the pile. It might be a big crumbly mixture, but don't worry. Once I start to knead it, it will come together quite well. So how to knead is three stages. First, I want to kind of get a little flour in my hands and fold the dough in half. Push down with the palm of my hands and quarter turn. Then we're going to repeat this. Fold the dough in half, push down, quarter turn. So make sure that you're getting flour underneath the dough so it doesn't stick. Fold the dough in half, push down, quarter turn. Keep going until our gluten has been developed and you start to see that our dough becomes nice and smooth. And when you go to do a spring test on the dough, the dough should slightly bounce back. That's because there has been enough gluten developed in the dough that it has some good structure and some spring. So here I go, I'm gonna to touch the top of the dough with my finger and see if it bounces back. If I don't like the way it bounces, I might go one or two more times, but if I'm happy, I'll leave the dough as is. It's important you have enough gluten developed and enough layers so that our product has a good chance of having great structure. So here I go, I test it again, and yep, my gluten is finally developed. Step nine. Roll dough into a 23 centimeter by 15 centimeter or nine inch by six inch rectangle, about the size of your recipe when it is folded in half. Should be about 1.2 centimeter or half inch thick. When I go to roll out the dough, I might give another sprinkling of flour on top so that it doesn't stick to the rolling pin. I also might want to use some of that sifted flour to coat my rolling pin and get a nice dusting on it. It's really important that the dough doesn't want to wrap around the rolling pin, so have lots of flour. Now most people just roll back and forth like this. It doesn't really do much in the rolling department. What we actually want to do is start in the middle and push out from the middle and change directions. Each time I start from the middle, push out. This ensures we don't get thin edges and that we don't have a mound of dough in the middle. Now I always say to my students, if you want a rectangle, keep it a rectangle. So periodically stop and shape your dough. I'm also going to make sure I put more flour underneath it. And here I go, more shaping and more rolling. Again, periodically stop to keep your dough in its rectangle form. Again, if you notice the dough getting sticky, always add more flour. We want to make sure that it doesn't wrap around the rolling pin. 
Now I really like the pastry mat because there is a grid and I can actually count how many inches I rolled out wide and how many inches I rolled out lengthwise and keeping it by six and nine inches. That way I have the perfect size rectangle. You can always double check. It should be less than half a sheet of your recipe. And if you did it too long, you can always go back and shape your dough. Step 10, except for a two centimeter, three fourth of an inch strip along one of the long edges, spread the surface of the dough with margarine. Now, one thing I'm going to do is really take my margarine and make it spreadable in the custard cup by rubbing it back and forth. Because if it's too hard, it will rip my dough. Then what I'm going to do is using the dinner knife, make sure I spread it along the dough, but I'm gonna make sure I leave a two cm um, gap along one of the long edges. This is because we need some dough to help pinch together. If there is butter on that length, the dough won't pinch. It's too greasy, it can't stick together. So you have to leave that little strip uncovered just so we can seal it all together. Make sure the margarine is evenly spread on the dough so that way when it melts with the sugar, the filling will be even throughout every single one of the pinwheels and you won't have more caramel or dry filling in one versus the other. Step 11, in a custard cup, combine brown sugar and cinnamon, sprinkle over margarine. If using, sprinkle raisins and chopped walnuts over top. Let's create our filling. In a custard cup, I'm going to start measuring out my brown sugar. Don't forget to pack your brown sugar down in the small measures so that we remove any air that might be in it. Then add in your cinnamon and give it a really good stir. Break up the brown sugar and combine the two. I always have a student who accidentally puts the cinnamon on one part of the cinnamon roll and then it's not equally distributed throughout the whole entire mixture. So we want to combine it first so that that doesn't accidentally happen. Then sprinkle this mixture all along the margarine that we've already spread on the dough. You can use your fingers to help pat it in to the margarine so that way we know it's going to stick together and that way you can distribute the filling and also if there's any large chunks you can break it up with your fingers. Now if you're choosing to use the walnuts you need to help cut them on the cutting board. Use your chef's knife to do a gentle rock and chop motion back and forth across the top of the nuts. Make sure you keep your fingers away from the blade. Be mindful that you don't cut yourself. If you're using the raisins, make sure you have drained all the water from them. You can do this by putting them in a sieve in your sink. Once you have all the water off the raisins, you can put them into the filling. If they have too much water, they might accidentally interfere with how the margarine absorbs the brown sugar in the baking process. So very important that they've been drained and thoroughly dried. Sprinkle in the walnuts on top and then we can go on to the next step. Step 12. Starting from one of the long sides, roll dough up jelly roll style. Pinch seam together. Now we're going to start at the long side where the filling goes straight to the edge. We're trying to roll it towards the side that is left uncovered. That's how we're going to pinch it together in the end. So let's start on this long side. Slowly and tightly roll it together, keeping all your fillings inside. Don't worry if some falls out the edge, we will deal with that but we're gonna make sure we roll it tightly. And if you notice your dough is a little bit dry because it's been left setting out, you can always wet it, your fingertips, and kind of pinch it together that way. Sometimes a little water will help make the dough stick together. So go ahead, pinch the seam nice and sealed. Make sure it's done well, because if not, what happens is the cinnamon rolls will uncurl in the oven. So it's very important that this is well pinched together. Step 13, cut into six equal slices, like cutting sushi. If sticking out, push walnuts and raisins into the roll. So one thing is my pastry mat is not a cutting board. It's not strong enough for a knife. It would cut right through. So we're going to use a cutting board and transfer our jelly roll onto it so we can use a knife safely. Let's move to a clean countertop. Then I'm going to take my chef's knife and cut across the roll into six equal pieces. Don't worry if your ends are a little jagged, we can use the knife to trim those up too. So let's remove the ends and put them into the compost. Divide the roll in half and then cut each half into three equal slices. If you don't want to have the roll squished by a chef's knife, you could always use a piece of dental floss. That actually helps slice the roll while keeping it in its circular formation. Just make sure if you're using dental floss that it's unflavored. If it's mint, it will affect the overall taste of your cinnamon pinwheel. 
Step 14. Place cut side up or down in the prepared muffin cups. So we want to make sure that when we transfer them to the muffin cup, we sort of reshape our rolls a little bit, especially if they were squished by the chef's knife. So in your hand, just kind of mold them back into their circular form. So make sure they're placed cut side up or down. What I mean by that is that you actually see the swirl of the cinnamon roll. Sometimes students transfer them into the muffin tin and they kind of look like little buns and we don't want that to happen. So don't worry if the cinnamon rolls are smaller than the muffin tin. They do expand when they're in the oven and they will fill the whole entire cup. Step 15, bake for 12 to 15 minutes. Now baking temperatures are often quite short for biscuits. They usually rise quite quickly with that baking powder reaction and form their structure. We wanna make sure the outsides are just hardened, but the insides are pillowy soft. Step 16, display your sample for marking along with your clean and dry muffin tin. Make sure you put a hot mat down on the counter when you go to remove your pinwheels out of the oven. And when you go to transfer them on a cooling rack, you should use two forks to help lift them up out of the muffin tin and to the rack. We wanna do this as quickly as possible because the muffin tin is still as hot as the oven and could continue to cook the bottoms of your cinnamon pinwheels, burning them. So go ahead, put that off to the side and make sure you spread them out on the cooling rack so they have a good chance to have air circulation and cool down, ready for me to mark. The yield for this recipe is six pinwheels, nine pinwheels for a group of three. Test for doneness. One should be golden brown on bottom and edges. Two should be double in height. Standards. One, golden brown on bottom and edges only. Biscuit dough is often quite pale. It's only in the oven for less than 15 minutes, so it shouldn't golden brown completely throughout the whole entire dough. I should only see it on the bottom of the cinnamon roll or on the very edges that were exposed to the air. Two, texture, light, tender, and flaky. Layers can be seen. When I break apart the cinnamon pinwheel, I should see a nice compact structure I should see layers that are separating nicely from being rapidly expanded in the oven. And what I shouldn't see is large glutinous tunnels. If I see gluten tunnels, that tells me you probably overhandled the dough or added too much water in activating the gluten. Three, symmetrical in shape and equal size, the same size and shape. When I look at all six pinwheels, I can tell that they were cut roughly the same, that the height is the same, and that they have a lovely circle shape. That means you reshaped it with your hands and you didn't allow the squish shape from the knife to be present when it was baking. These are all the standards for the cinnamon pinwheels. Let's take a look at my demonstration. Here I have one of my pinwheels and what you can see is a lovely circular shape when I look at the edges, I notice that they're only golden brown on the very edge, only where the hot oven air was exposed to the dough. You see a lovely swirl shape, which means I took the time to reshape it with my hands after I cut it with a knife. Now let's take a look at the actual inside texture. I'm going to see that the dough is quite puffy and it's only crusty slightly on the edge, which means it probably has a good gluten structure. When I rip off a small tear, I can look inside and see a compact grain, no giant large gluten tunnels, and I see that it's been properly mixed and kneaded. Also, my biscuit layers have expanded rapidly, making it so that it was double in height. These cinnamon pinwheels are a great way for you to learn the traditional biscuit method. Gets you a chance to use a biscuit cutter to cut up the margin and also to get a chance to get your hands in there and knead that dough. I hope you enjoyed this demonstration. Happy baking and thanks for watching.